Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV. Today we're talking with David Stockman, a former congressman who is best remembered as the budget director for Ronald Reagan. David, thanks for talking with us. Good to be here. You're back in the uh, in the spotlight and getting roasted again by your uh, fellow Republicans uh, because you've been an outspoken advocate of letting all of the Bush era tax rates expire. What's your rationale behind that? Well, in pure philosophy, lower tax rates would be better. Uh, the problem is we've had a 30-year referendum on spending, every aspect of the welfare state. We made a tiny bit of progress in 81. That was restored uh, over the course of the next couple of decades. Then we finally had Republican government in the Bush era, both in the Congress and in the White House, and nothing was cut. Right. Everything was ratified. In fact, uh, they added to uh, Medicare through the drug benefit right. And yeah, education. And in fact, uh, so now Bush we're at a point. Raised, Bush right. raised the total federal outlays about 60% in 2010 dollars. That's exactly yeah, right. So. so now we're at the point where we have this large welfare state that mm -hmm. seems immovable politically and this uh, expanding warfare state that mm -hmm. both parties seem to want to fund. Right. And in that environment, uh, you're kidding yourself if you think cutting taxes today is really cutting taxes. We're simply deferring right. massive tax increases into the future, yes. unfairly and immorally putting huge debt burdens on future generations, and that is just wrong. There's a presumption there that if we raised more federal revenue, that would go to pay what we're, what we're actually doing now, as opposed to just give the government more impetus to grow even faster. Well, that's always a risk, but um, I think uh, the fact is uh, there isn't much pressure for structural expansion of the budget right now. So Does there need to be, though? Because, I mean, Medicare spending is set to continue to expand, uh, particularly after 2020. I mean, so there doesn't need to be a politician saying, let's raise, uh, let's create whole new entitlements, because we've got ones that are on autopilot to explode, right? Oh, yes. I mean, the uh, cost trajectory of the entitlements and the program structure that is there will rise over time. And part of the fiscal battle will be to find ways to contain that. So I very strongly believe that in addition to allowing the tax cuts to expire, we need to means test yeah. radically the retirement entitlements. In the past few years, we've seen under Bush and then continued under, under uh, President Obama, things like TARP, uh, things like stimulus spending. I mean, it started under Bush in, in 2008, was obviously uh, kicked into high gear by Obama. Are we in a place now where bailouts will become a constant uh, part of American life? Well, that is a pressure and that is a clear risk. Uh, I believe in some ways it was a profound moment in political history in September 2008 when Paulson panicked. Mm -hmm. And of course, Bush was a deer in a headlight. He had no clue about what was going on and stampeded the Republicans into enacting TARP why was TARP a bad idea? I mean, we have uh, President Bush, we have President Obama, we have Tim Geithner, we have a bunch of uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning economists telling us, uh, we have Warren Buffett saying, TARP, you know, that's the only reason you and I are still talking. It's the only reason why there's still lights on. Well, uh, first of all, that's urban mythology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was panic on Main Street in America. What was happening was that the big uh, pyramids of debt on Wall Street were coming crashing down, and had we allowed nature to take its course, maybe the Goldman Sachs stock would have gone down to $10, right. but that's their problem, and that's the problem of speculators who own the stock not a problem, mm -hmm. systematic problem for the economy. Maybe a couple of banks would have been closed by the FDIC, and whether you believe in uh, deposit insurance or not, which I don't, it was there, and that was the function of deposit insurance. So we why, did, yeah, what, what happened then? Why did that win the political battle? Because uh, Paulson, uh, frankly, is the most incompetent, uh, reckless Secretary of the Treasury we've had in modern history, if ever. And uh, he had no schooling in public policy. He had no schooling in the longer term issues of fiscal management or even, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what sound money is all about, for crying out loud. And as a result, as the uh, crisis uh, metastasized in September, October of 2008, and he got all these panic calls from his buddies on mm -hmm. Wall Street who were seeing their pyramids mm -hmm. of debt come crashing down and particularly when the stock of Goldman Sachs started to plunge, 
He panicked. Uh, there mm -hmm. was no philosophy behind it. There was never an analysis done. Mm -hmm. This whole idea that there was systemic risk, it's just a term made up mm -hmm. uh, by people who were looking for ways to meddle in the economy. Do you and, think that uh, he ran with it? Should the feds have, uh, the Fed or the feds or uh, any uh, portion of the federal government, should they have bailed out Bear Stern? Should they have bailed out Lehman Brothers? Should they have bailed out Goldman Sachs? Should they have bailed out GM? Do, do bailouts at any point make sense? No, I think yeah. absolutely not. Once uh, the broad public sees uh, that the cronies of capitalism right. are bailed out uh, by their friends in Washington or the Fed, why should they believe that uh, the system we have is fair or is working in their interest? Isn't this the oldest story of American capitalism, which is that there is always at some point there is uh, somebody who's too big to fail or, or more correctly, uh, too politically connected to fail? Well, I think the risk has always been there, but historically there was, at least in the Republican Party, principled beliefs that... Um, the marketplace had to be allowed to operate mm -hmm. and that both gains and losses would occur. And even though there was pressure from time to time for interventions and mm -hmm. bailouts, it was pretty rare, if at all, during the Eisenhower administration, for instance, even though uh, Ike was suspected of not being a good conservative. Oh, he, by he was many. suspected of being a communist by the, uh, <laughs> well, by the uh, If side. you look yeah. at the economic yeah. policy of the Eisenhower era, it was pretty solid. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually believed in balancing right. the budget and budge, uh, balanced the budget three times. Right. Uh, during the Ford era, um, again, President Ford was pretty much a free enterprise believer, and uh, there aren't too many examples that you could come up with where there was outright bailouts. But uh, I think uh, the problem really gather, gathered momentum in the late 70s uh, after inflation got out yeah. of control because we closed the gold window in 1971, uh, then politicians began to find uh, reasons for expediency. The Chrysler bailout was a terrible uh, mm -hmm. uh, thing. In Even though it kept the company alive, it's well, still It kept with the company us alive and, yeah. long enough so that it could die yeah, again right. and take GM down with it and cause a second bailout. Right. Uh, in the Reagan era, I thought we were free enterprise, and mostly we were, but we bailed out Continental right. Bank. Yeah. Uh, against the strong belief of myself and many others in the administration that it was kind of forced through so in what, panic. What do you so do with the savings and loan? These things began to yeah, build. What do you do with savings and loan? Was that systemic risk when the savings and loan uh, uh, industry collapsed? Well, uh, first of all, the uh, problem that blew up in the late mm -hmm. 80s was encouraged by bad mistakes sure. made by the Reagan administration in the early mm -hmm. 80s. We deregulated the SNLs and allowed them to speculate in all kinds mm -hmm. of real estate and uh, land development and so which forth. Per which per se is not a problem, right? It's but a it's problem that, if they have guaranteed uh, deposit right. uh, insurance and if they have uh, federal uh, entities uh, to turn to to bail them mm -hmm. out if they make reckless mistakes. Well, all of them did. And so we ended up with uh, insolvent institutions mm -hmm. in mass in the late 80s and I think they did more or less a reasonable job of dealing with that because all of them were closed and liquidated and losses mm -hmm. were absorbed by the equity speculators and mm -hmm. the you know, junior bond speculators in these failed SNLs. The depositors were uh, protected because that's what the right. deposit insurance system is. Uh, but it was a good lesson that we had danger built into the heart of our banking system mm -hmm. because of deposit insurance, which allowed speculators mm -hmm. to raise money without people worrying about the risk of investing. And uh, they had access to the mm -hmm. Fed window, which says that if you really go off the edge of the cliff mm -hmm. and become illiquid because you're investing long and funding short, which is foolish and has always been frowned upon by sound banking theory historically, we should have seen it coming. Mm -hmm. uh, with the, in other words, the SNL crisis was a wake-up call that deposit insurance and the mm. Fed were about ready to fuel a far greater mm. uh, banking system bubble and blow up. And sure enough, 15 years later, that's exactly yeah. what we had. And then when the crisis came, 
we went in and bailed out the whole thing again and have just created the condition for even more uh, traumatic uh, excess in the future. Now, uh, but we've solved all our problems, right, with the Dodd-Frank financial uh, regulation bill, uh, you know, which is being touted certainly by the Obama administration and I guess by uh, Chris Dodd and Barney Frank as, you know, the be-all and end-all. Does that change anything? Does it address any of the issues that you're, um, that you're talking about and does it make you sleep easier at night knowing that we're now regulated in a different way? Uh, well, really not at all, because it's just another uh, sort of crony capitalist uh, shuffle. Uh, if we really have a problem in our banking system of too big to fail, which I profoundly believe we do, then the institutions involved are too big to exist. And by that, I mean exist with access to uh, the federal deposit insurance guarantees and therefore the ability to raise mm -hmm hundreds of billions or trillions of deposits, and with access to the Fed window. So what happened? At the end of 2007, uh, before the crisis actually hit fully, the top four banks in this country had five trillion of asset footings combined. After the whole crisis of too big to fail and all of the bailouts and putting the taxpayer in harm's way uh, in, in a manner never done before, Today, the top four banks have seven trillion right. of asset footings. So what we did uh, and what the uh, FIDIC and the Federal Reserve did in their wisdom was to actually just uh, steepen and enlarge yeah. the problem. So I believe in narrow banking. Uh, I believe that if you're going to have deposit insurance, it should be for banks that can lend uh, 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 for only short periods of mm -hmm. time for commercial activities where the risk of loss is minimal. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be in the speculation business, if you want to be in the over-the-counter derivatives marketing business, uh, if you want to make long-term loans in speculative real estate and even uh, business enterprises, fine. Be my guest, do it as a free enterprise financial mm -hmm. institution, but don't look for guaranteed deposits to raise your funding, mm -hmm. and don't think you should ac have access to the Fed window in case you make a discount window, that is, in, in the event that you make large mistakes. That is the fundamental line of demarcation that needs to be addressed, and the legislation passed by Congress, the mm -hmm. so-called FinReg, doesn't do any of that. It simply involves 2,300 pages of Enabling Act, which empowers the same institutions who fostered this right. crisis, the Fed, the FDIC, the controller, uh, to uh, determine what those mean. And it uh, more or less is a full employment act for lobbyists, right. lawyers, accounting consultants, and so forth to find ways uh, to build loopholes uh, which is easy enough to do. Now, in the uh, New York Times over the summer, you laid uh, one of uh, the four uh, deformations of the uh, fiscal apocalypse on the, on the uh, heads of uh, pointless speculation in stocks, bonds, commodities, and derivatives. Are you arguing that um, essentially that these this trade only existed because of regulations or of, of a government system or a political economy where people knew if they were playing around with that kind of stuff that they would get bailed out? Well, I think it goes beyond or further back than that. I think it goes to the closing of the gold window mm -hmm. in 1971. It goes to um, the destruction. And that because the last shred of anchoring the U.S. dollar to a gold standard. Yes, and because that system, as it had its defects, Bretton mm -hmm. Woods, but at the heart of it was a fixed exchange rate system and an obligation on each company and in country, including mm -hmm. the United States, to settle its accounts at the end of every year. And if you began to run chronic payments deficits, mm -hmm. you were going to, under that system, lose your monetary reserves. Gold, right. if you were the United States, or dollar uh, reserve assets if you were other participants in the system. And what that did was foster continuous financial discipline mm -hmm. because any country losing large-scale reserves would find its banking system contracting, interest rates rising, 
its economy slowing down, and uh, the basis for sustainable adjustment to occur. Now, when we got rid of all of that hmm. and went to pure fiat money, it began a process in which uh, financial volatility and instability uh, reached what had been uh, previously unimaginable levels. And so if you have exchange rates careening all over the place, if you have interest rates soaring and then declining and then bouncing to and fro, the market will invent uh, hedges, which mm -hmm. is to say uh, currency futures uh, and hedges of every kind, interest rate uh, hedges mm -hmm. uh, of every imaginable kind, in order to um, meet the need of participants in the system to have some certainty about um, the value, uh, uh, value of things. Mm -hmm. So I think much of this massive, uh, you know, 700 trillion mm -hmm. <laughs> derivatives market which is out there uh, was fostered by the breakdown of fixed exchange rates and the anchor of the monetary system to a asset, gold in that case, that couldn't be manipulated for short-term purposes by governments and central banks. Once these things were invented because of the turbulence in the market for legitimate hedging, there was nothing to stop all the casino players to, from jumping in and simply speculating. Uh, you know, this is probably a good time to bring up uh, some of your uh, Austrian friends, uh, Austrian economists. Uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, you would have somebody like Murray Rothbard, who uh, believed in, uh, I guess, free banking, but also a gold standard. Then you had somebody like uh, Friedrich Hayek, who talked about competing currencies. And, you know, with the breakdown of the gold standard, the breakdown of Bretton Woods, don't we effectively have what Hayek would consider a market in competing currencies? Different countries, uh, or, or something like the EU, to the extent that their money isn't sound, investors will devalue it, and and they'll move. You know, the market will respond to that. Why is that not working in a way that Bretton Woods might have at some point to kind of keep people from just running up or printing out cheap money? Well, I think because mainly the system that he imagined, if I understand it correctly, was privately issued currencies. Mm -hmm. What we have is currency issued by the sovereign, yeah. the United States, mm -hmm. in unlimited quantities in the context of a global system where all the other central banks are lined up in some kind of... Uh, you know, uh, a caravan mm -hmm. uh, trying to uh, mimic the policies of the Fed, uh, mostly defensively. When right. we flood the world with dollars, or the Fed does, they have to buy them up and print their own currency in order to uh, prevent their exchange rate from going up. So when this is a government-issued currency, um, uh, I think you get the exact mess that mm -hmm. we have today. Um, ultimately, uh, what really is, is the, the issue is the need for periodic settlement of accounts, mm -hmm. financial discipline. And once we got rid of that, what happened was something Milton Friedman said could never happen. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, don't worry about uh, the balance of payments crisis under Bretton Woods. Uh, essentially, close the gold window, uh, let the dollar float, and the world currency market will take care of trade imbalances. He was totally wrong. Hmm. We've had $8 trillion worth of cumulative current account deficits with the rest of the world since the late uh, 1970s, year after year. What, what is the real effect of that, though? Because some people would say, well, you know what that means is that we're getting more for our money. No, uh, the real effect of it is that we're living way beyond our means. Hmm. We're uh, building up service obligations to the holders of all hmm. that uh, paper. I mean, when you run a current account, it's the same thing as borrowing from the rest of the world. Uh, the Chinese own well over a trillion dollars uh, of claims on the United States and the Japanese and the OPEC producers and on and on you could go. So uh, the idea that we're getting something for free is, uh, mm -hmm. makes no sense to me. And second, you're encouraging the mercantilist you know, export model of East Asia to become even more virulently destructive than it actually is because they somehow believe they can export their way to permanent prosperity and if they have to build up massive dollar reserves uh, of greater and greater and greater magnitude, which is exactly mm. what they're doing, 
uh, they seem to think that will work. Obviously, in the long run, it won't. Japan is already yeah. proof of that. But uh, it leads to these kinds of massive imbalances and distortions in international trade and monetary system that I believe are on the verge of uh, major conflagration uh, as uh, uh, the whole thing uh, heats up. Let's uh, talk a, a little bit about your uh, kind of political philosophy and economic philosophy. You went to Michigan State. You were a congressman from Michigan before you became budget director. You've written fondly of people like uh, Hayek and uh, Anne Murray Rothbard, Mises, not so hot on Friedman or certainly the Keynesians. Where did these ideas come from? When did you get interested in economics? And how do you define yourself in, in economic terms? Well, I think the thing you left out is that, yes, I grew up in Michigan, but I was a uh, anti-war radical okay. <laughs> as a student Great. at Michigan State. So I guess uh, in the heat of uh, uh, you know, the uh, total nonsense mm -hmm. of the Vietnam War, I developed a skepticism of the warfare state right. and uh, of the military and of a uh, adventurist mm -hmm. uh, Were you policy. always a Republican? Uh, no, I was no. a SDS quasi-Marxist mm -hmm. radical. Uh, then, um, as I uh, went uh, uh, to Capitol Hill as a mm -hmm. staffer, um, I uh, began to see the virtues of what I would call the libertarian mm -hmm. uh, view, which isn't that far from, sure. in some ways, the, the radical left that mm -hmm. we looked at, uh, that I th felt I believed in as Talk a student. About what, what's the common thread? Well, I think the common thread is that um, you know individual uh, uh, action and. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 freedom and liberty to pursue both economic or other mm -hmm. uh, ends is uh, the core of what society mm -hmm. should be built on. Um, and so I became very uh, interested in free market economics as mm -hmm. a staffer on Capitol Hill. Then I was elected to Congress, mm -hmm. uh, pursued that Talk further. Talk a little bit about who were you a staffer for and then how, you know, to say, and then I was elected to Congress as if, uh, you know, you were walking down the street yeah. and got hit, uh, yeah. you know, by something falling out of a window. Right. Uh, what, what went into those determinations? Well, I was a uh, staffer for uh, Congressman John Anderson, who mm -hmm. uh, was uh, yeah. chairman of the Republican caucus, considered a moderate, but actually he was the right kind of Republican in my mm -hmm. view because he was a social liberal and an economic right. conservative. And the work I did was a lot of uh, things on uh, deregulating transportation, uh, let's sure. say, the minimum wage being counterproductive, mm -hmm. the need to uh, reorganize uh, or, or eliminate the mm -hmm. whole Great Society uh, uh, set of programs that had uh, developed and so forth. On the other hand, uh, he, as a moderate on social issues, didn't believe the government ought to be intervening in our private lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, I agree with that. I agreed right. with that then, and I still do now. So it was out of that period that I more uh, uh, fully formed uh, my philosophy. Mm -hmm. I ran for Congress then and was elected in 1976 mm -hmm. uh, and had a chance to begin to develop those ideas legislatively, uh, maybe culminating in two battles that I mm -hmm. uh, fought, uh, uh, three really, uh, before I went into the Reagan White House. One was deregulation of natural gas, but right. that was the leading edge of the whole fight with a Carterite mm -hmm. statist energy mm -hmm. policy. I was on the Energy Committee and was one of the leaders of the fight for deregulating natural gas, but opposing all the other Carter nonsense, right. like Sin Fuels Corporation right, yeah. and uh, regulatory standards for the energy efficiency of toasters and so forth. Right. So I began to see there the danger of statist industrial policy right. or economic policy and had some good experience fighting it. And it's the peculiar, too, that, I mean, Carter was really very good at deregulating, because uh, he also deregulated interstate trucking, railroads, and airplanes, but then was just a statist in other, in kind of fanciful dreams that he had, right? Yeah, well, I think it depended on the advisors. Uh, mm -hmm. He had some advisors yeah. who could see the insanity of the CAB, uh, right, Civil yeah. Aeronautics Board, or the ICC trying right. to set tens of thousands yeah. of... Uh, rail tariffs and so forth, trucking tariffs. But then in the energy side, because again of short-run panic mm -hmm. about what was going on with OPEC and the oil price, which really was a function of inflationary monetary policy. Right. 
but the bad monetary policy led to a perception that there was something mm -hmm. wrong in the energy economy, which generated, uh, uh, you know, Professor Schlesinger and all yeah. his minions running around trying to create a state-run energy sector. So I yeah. fought that, and I learned a lot about the danger. Then, shortly after that, came the Chrysler bailout. Right. And I was uh, from Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of uh, Chrysler suppliers in my district, but mm -hmm. I strongly support, uh, opposed it, gave a loud speech on the mm -hmm. floor about it, uh, found that uh, Lee Iacocca uh, <laughs> was about ready to run me out of the state on a rail, or wished he could have. Right. But you know, the well, thing he is, couldn't have used a Chrysler. That's <laughs> for sure, right? But the thing is, uh, I was right. Not only that, but in the next election, I got the largest vote I'd ever so received. So, what what does that say about political economy, though? Because I mean, there you are in Michigan, and you're running against one of the fair-haired boys, one of the major employers in the state, and saying like, no, they should live or die in the market and it didn't hurt you politically? Because uh, the rank and file of businessmen in my district, little machine mm -hmm. tool shops or someone ru uh, running a plant where they uh, mixed uh, fertilizers, yeah. let's say, and distributed to farmers. Yeah, what area were you? Uh, uh, southwestern Michigan. Okay. Uh, and it was a kind of half ag, mm -hmm. half yep. industrial, knew that they weren't mm -hmm. too big to fail. Right that uh, if they were ever up against the wall, uh, their creditors would put them into right. Chapter 11, and that's the way the system worked. So uh, I had overwhelming support, except for the few squeaky wheels, mm -hmm. a couple, half dozen uh, suppliers who sold parts mm -hmm. to Chrysler. And I think uh, the problem we have in our political system is that enough politicians uh, are not willing to think that through. They hear the squeaky mm -hmm. wheel and they respond, and they really don't have to. I also was a liberal on social issues, mm -hmm. voted against, uh, you know, the Hyde Amendment, mm -hmm. uh, anti-abortion amendment mm -hmm. 110 times, mm -hmm. and my district was very conservative, but they respected my opinion. So mm -hmm. I think uh, the idea that you just have to kowtow to all the pressure groups and all the uh, squeaky wheels mm -hmm. uh, is not really necessary, but now, 30 years later, is probably unavoidable because money has become such a massive force in the electoral process. Okay, so you go from being in Congress to becoming uh, Reagan's budget director. And, you know, among other things, what that produced was your uh, memoir, uh, The Triumph of Politics. Right. But talk a little bit about what you came into the Reagan administration and you, you believe the hype, right? That he was going to cut taxes and he was going to cut spending. He was going to cut the size and scope of, uh, of government, of the federal government. Uh, and you went, oh, you know, you worked long and hard on coming up with the way to cut taxes, right? Right. And that was successful? Uh, give for people who don't remember uh, really high marginal tax rates in the U.S., what did you cut? What did Reagan cut the top tax rates from? All right. The top tax rate uh, on earned income was 50% at the time, and I think we ended up in the low 40s. But mm -hmm. it was about a 30% yeah. cut. Um, uh, the, the thing I learned out of that tax cutting exercise uh, was twofold. One is that, and this is still not uh, focused on, there wasn't much popular support for across the board rate reductions mm -hmm. that would benefit the average uh, citizen or even entrepreneur businessmen. Mm -hmm. Uh, the only way that we got that through, despite all the urban legend that exists today, was through a massive Christmas tree of special interest tax uh, benefits and loopholes that were appended to it. The numbers are simple. The revenue reduction was a trillion dollars over five years from the tax cut. Half of it, 500 billion, was for the rate reduction. The other half was for oil uh, depletion incentives. Right. Uh, real estate tax breaks. So, in um, other words, you're giving back half of that by well, th through uh, through goods. Yeah, and, and so we place. ended up reducing right. the revenue far beyond what was feasible, even if there had been a determination to really cut spending. Mm -hmm. But what happened subsequently was almost no spending was cut, right. and the defense budget soared out of control. We knew going in that there was a commitment by uh, President Reagan to rebuild defense capability. But what happened in the early days was that the Pentagon um, distorted mm -hmm. campaign promises for real growth 
of 5%, which they then raised to 7%, right. and Reagan went along. And then they started it from a much higher base, which is mm -hmm. to say a supplemental bill. So uh, and as a result of that, defense spending got totally out of control, right. even massively. Though, even though uh, discretionary, non-defense discretionary spending was, was coming down. A little bit. But it did not, come down. Not all that much. But we but, cut very little out of yeah. the entitlements other, other than some things that were uh, appropriate and mm -hmm. have survived, food stamp reform and uh, AFDC, mm -hmm. but the middle class entitlements weren't cut, the, the whole complex of veterans programs weren't cut, mm -hmm. um, agricultural subsidies were not uh, seriously mm -hmm. tampered with, and so as a result of that, uh, we may have gotten a few tens of billions mm -hmm. annually of savings, but over time, most of that crept back in. Why the wasn't, I mean, Reagan was uh, famous for, of course, saying that government wasn't the solution to the problem, government was the problem. Why wasn't he more skeptical <clears throat> of Pentagon claims of, uh, of what they needed and of where, where their financial estimates were coming from? That's uh, one of the, um, I guess, maybe mysteries uh, of the time, and it's one of the factors that led to the utter failure of spending control. He mm -hmm. utterly was, uh, he was utterly uninterested in any detail of the defense budget, of any of the claims for dollars made by the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. He gave them a blank check without question, and that had a twofold effect. One, it ballooned spending just as we were uh, massively reducing the revenue. But second, it created an enormous political um, impasse. Mm -hmm. And that is that we, the spending increases were so huge in defense that it became almost impossible to get anybody to look at you with a straight face on right. Capitol Hill and say, uh, we're going to go after the food stamp program or we're going to go right. after uh, you know, uh, women's, infants, and children yeah. uh, feeding program or uh, school lunches when you're just showering tens of billions of dollars on you know, ammunition <laughs> accounts and uh, spare parts mm -hmm. replacements and a massive expansion of the Navy, which was totally uh, uncalled for. Well, here's a question, uh, though. Did, so I mean, at least we won the Cold War. Was, was the defense buildup, was it necessary in your mind to, uh, you know, to us actually winning the Cold War? At the well, end I don't know. Day? Someone said that the, uh, the uh, SDI, the Star mm -hmm. Wars, was right. never a program. It was a speech. Right. But the speech <laughs> was enough to make uh, Gorbachev realize right. that it was game over. But my view is that communism never worked. Mm -hmm. The Soviet Union was a house of cards from day one in 1917. It was only a matter of time if we had mm -hmm. really believed our free enterprise principles and our understanding mm -hmm. of a free society and capitalism, we would have realized mm -hmm. in 1980 that the Soviet Empire was going to collapse mm -hmm. sooner or later on its own weight and we didn't need to try to spend it into a mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, collapse because it was already happening. So I don't buy the idea that this huge Reagan buildup, mm -hmm. defense buildup, was what allowed us to win the Cold War. Someone said that in the 1980s we were in a race with the Soviet Union to see who could reach bankruptcy first. Yeah. Uh, they won yeah. <laughs> by a hair, but uh, it's not really the defense budget that did it. Between 81 and 85, uh, basically the Reagan administration doubled the national debt. You left office, or you left the White House in 85. Uh, by 88, it had gone up about two and a half times. What would you have done differently, knowing, knowing how things played out, if you were starting again as budget director in 1981? Well, I think you would really have to sit down and make some very large and honest mm -hmm. uh, uh, conclusions. Um, and that is, how much defense do we really want? Let's mm -hmm. lay it out. Let's justify it. Let's uh, uh, analyze the trade-offs and right. so forth. That's one big piece of the state. Then what is the welfare state that we're going to keep because we don't have the political will to change mm -hmm. it or we believe it is mm -hmm. necessary? And if that's 24% of GDP or 20% mm -hmm. of GDP, then what is the optimum tax system that will raise 20% mm -hmm. or 24% as the case may be? And therefore, uh, if we need to lower income taxes, which I believed at the time and still mm -hmm. do for incentive purposes or because of bracket creep, mm -hmm. 
then what alternative revenue mechanisms, such as a value-added tax mm -hmm. or some other consumption-oriented tax, do we need to put in place to fund mm -hmm. the government we've well, have we, we have we had uh, well, there, uh, two things come to my mind on that. Have, why don't we have those conversations about defense, say, um, where you were saying earlier? I mean, one of you know, Obama won election partly as an anti-war candidate, and he is certainly, I mean, he's disappointed. I think everybody, maybe one of his daughters, still believes in him, but <laughs> you know, clearly, yeah. he he's a he's a war president, and he seems to be relishing that role, um, uh, but. You know, have we had an argument about what is the proper role of defense? Defense spending has gone up tremendously in the past 10 years. Um, you know, why don't we have those conversations? Well, uh, you know, I think it's partly the way the whole political debate and mm -hmm. ideology has evolved. I'll uh, simply point out the last honest war president we had was Truman, mm -hmm. uh, surprisingly. And when the Vietnam or the Korean War budget ballooned, he demanded the Congress institute major tax increases, excise mm -hmm. taxes, income taxes, to pay for the war on a pay-as-you-go mm -hmm. basis. Now, I'm not sure we ever accomplished anything useful in the Korean War right. <laughs> in the light of right. history. Um, but he was right at the time mm -hmm. if you were going to do this. We we always should have had the principle that if you're going to have a Vietnam War mm -hmm. or a Gulf War I or an no. Iraqi uh, invasion, uh, then attach it to war finance, to right. the taxes needed. And one, I think you'll get a better decision. Right. People will yeah. ask, do we want sure. to spend $100 billion on wars of uh, occupation in, in mm -hmm. places that are the ends of the earth right. and not strategically um, uh, important. If not because of an explicit conversation, but because of historical reality, since 1950, uh, uh, federal revenues have averaged about 18 percent of GDP. That seems to be the amount of money at any point that we're willing to shell out in a given year. And it goes up or down a little bit, but it's never been higher than about 20.6% of GDP, and it's at one of its relative lows this year, partly because of the recession. But, you know, why can, is it impossible to say, okay, we're going to peg our spending, our total outlays in any given year to 18% or 19% if we have that conversation? I mean, are you, is the triumph of politics that we don't even get to have those conversations or that we'll have them, but then we don't really stick ourselves to it. We don't keep to a budget. Well, first, I think we need to have the conversations, but then we need to uh, recognize the underlying demographic context mm -hmm. of what the steady state claim on GDP is. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole entitlement structure, retirement entitlement, Social Security, mm -hmm. Medicare, it's an intergenerational Ponzi scheme. Right. The baby boom is now inexorably moving towards right. retirement and beyond. And so, therefore, the share of GDP that it's consuming continues to mm -hmm. rise. And if we take that and add uh, all of the other traditional functions of government, uh, the slight additions we've made to things like education, which right. are a bit out of control, and then a high level of defense spending, which we have but don't really need, in my mm -hmm. view, in sure. this world, you're in the uh, 22 to 25 percent range. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any way of getting out of that. Isn't there a way? We... I can say, you're at the you're at the leading edge of the baby boom, right? Right. Yeah, I'm at the the back end, and I can <laughs> right. tell you that I nothing would please me more than to see you and all of your cohort go off in an iceberg somewhere. <laughs> um, you know, part of this, and it goes back to your experience in the Reagan White House. Reagan was very much a child of the Great Depression and of World War II, and of an era in America of real privation. Um, by the time you came along, and by the time I came along, we were in the in the baby boom. It's a radically different world. I mean, you you are not growing old in your parents' world, in mm -hmm. your parents' America. You know, you're not talking about even in the mid '60s where uh, seniors had a much higher than average uh, poverty rate. Now they're far below the average poverty rate. Um, isn't it time that we restrike this intergenerational entitlement? I mean, because that is the problem. I mean, Medicare, Social Security, uh, not even so much Medicaid. I mean, it's time to, isn't it time to have that conversation and say the, the social bargain that governed America from about 1935 until about 1995 no longer applies? Yeah, I think that conversation will happen, but Do only... You, isn't that what the, I mean, yeah. is that, to talk about, I mean, reasons for hope or thin reeds for hope, 
is that what the Tea Party is about? Well, maybe there's a tiny glimpse that the conversation mm -hmm. is starting. I don't think the Tea Party is really that coherent. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, simply, I think, more a reaction to mm -hmm. the economic turmoil mm -hmm. that's occurred and the fear that's been generated in Main Street and the, pr and the uh, appropriate antipathy that's developed towards the crony capitalist right. uh, policy of bailing out anybody who's big and strong like GM uh, and Goldman Sachs and so forth. But beyond that, I don't think the conversation has really started, although the facts are that the current generation of workers are going to be turned into tax slaves, right. just like the workers in Ireland today yeah. <laughs> are finding out uh, that they are. And uh, uh, that will have to change, but it'll only change when the crisis comes. It's going to be a uh, very bad hair day, but it's unavoidable. Do you, uh, I mean, do you see anybody in the political arena who is, uh, you know, who gives you hope or who seems to get what you're talking about? Uh, on that, I think the heart of the problem is our monetary system is out of control. Mm -hmm. Our money printing is destroying and distorting and contorting our economy. It's mm -hmm. leading everything to a kind of casinos, speculative uh, uh, system, not a sustainable productivity-based growth system. There's only one guy who understands it. It's Ron Paul. Right. Well, There's no one else who understands he's, it. He's newly ascended in terms of uh, power, right? I That's mean, true. He, and, I uh, mean, so do you think that that will be the beginning, or, or could that be the beginning? Well, I a, think maybe it'll begin to uh, disinfect the process. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll begin to shed some light on all the pretensions mm -hmm. and the scholastic arrogance of the Fed, uh, Fed's uh, economist and the Federal Reserve itself, and that maybe is at least a small step towards beginning to address the real problems in this country. Well, David Stockman, uh, thank you very much for a really interesting conversation. Thank you.